G'day and welcome to the Campfire Project. Today I'm here with uh, Demi Chakalov, who's an international best-selling author and leadership coach. How are you, Demi? Good, good. Thank you. And I also have Irina Geller, who is a creator and owner of Food and Mood Coaching. How are you, oh, Irina? I'm very well, thank you. And Paula uh, Quincy, who is a uh, relationship expert and facilitator of building relationships and psychological safety. How are you, Paula? I'm well, thanks. And so great to be here. Thanks for having me as a guest. Oh, you're welcome. So we've got uh, quite a uh, range of places we're from. Uh, Demi's from Bulgaria, uh, Paul is from South Africa, and Irina's from Sydney, and I'm here north of Sydney in Newcastle. So we're quite a spread out all over the place with this conversation. And I think it's going to be interesting because we all work in sort of some of the fields cross over each other. But we wanted, to, and this is Mental Health uh, uh, Day at the moment, you know, International Mental Health mm. Day. And so that being the case, mental health, uh, is mental well-being in the workplace was something that, uh, uh, Irina, that you suggested that we have a bit of a talk about. Mm. So would you like to lead us off into this conversation? Sure. Well, I mean, firstly, I'd like to say that, you know, mental well-being or mental wellness, whatever you want to call it, is just... Um, Aside from it, you know, being a mental health mental health day, uh, mental well being day, um, is just so important, and it's not just important at home um, in relationships, but it's extremely important at work, because um, you know many of us spend um, quite a few hours at work, whether it be, you know, like working in a large um, company or working in a small company. Um, what really got me interested in this, aside from what I've just said, is a statistic I came across the other day, uh, which was four out of 10 Australians keeping silent at work about their mental health. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, that is just, you know, that's almost 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And so I looked into it a little bit further and I realized that there's still a stigma attached to talking about mental health. You know, people are still discriminated against and mm. they harassed about it and they bullied about it. And it's often assumed that poor mental health is a function of, of personal rather than a workplace issue. So people think, oh, well, you know, if you've got mental health issues, it's personal. You might have relationship problems at home, but often it can actually be a workplace issue, right? And the other thing is um, a lot of managers still don't have the skills to have conversations like that or to begin these difficult conversations. So therein lies the problem. Mm. And what I'd like to do today is maybe perhaps talk about some solutions, but see what the others, mm. what you guys think as well, what your experience is. Excellent. Because Paula, you work with the psychological safety in the workplace and things like that. So this would be an area that you'd um, you know, be seeing uh, this happening a lot as well, wouldn't you? Most definitely. We're definitely seeing employee engagement being very topical at the moment and mental health. Um, you know, obviously COVID has put the spotlight on mental health and how employees have realized that they have choices now and they're not afraid to push back and exercise those choices when it comes to what is the kind of quality of life or lifestyle that I want for myself, mm -hmm. my own well-being and that of my family as well? And making some of those decisions to either leave um, organizations and I'm going to use the word downscale their lifestyle, but downscale their lifestyle to what they see as quality lifestyle for them, where, they, where they're putting their own needs and their own well-being and that of their family as a priority first. And it's not so much about the paycheck these days, it's around the benefits and the perks. And one of those key things that is going to be a distinct advantage going forward in terms of not only retaining talent, but attracting talent is what support structures do you as an organization have in place that shows me and tells me you are serious about my mental health and well-being as, as your employee. And, and Demi, with the leadership work that you're doing, what, what uh, impact what do you have there? Uh, so the first thing I would say is that I I haven't, we haven't spoken with the others here, but I, I've been, before I came back to Bulgaria, I was seven years in Denmark. And in Denmark, uh, they work a lot with with this. It's a country where well-being is at a very high level, I, I would say. Uh, 
in the workplace as well. Uh, even I think they go to the other extreme that people get uh, kind of excused with the with their well being. So that's that's another another topic. But I think it's good to see that you know the two places and that they are places which is still a lot of work there, and they see it as. Uh, something. Oh, you you have well, pro, you know, some problems with mental health. Just shut up and work or something. Or the other places when they people when they say, oh, okay, I have some problem with depression, and people say, okay, just go and take vacation, do everything you can do. So I've been in in both places, and I see that. Uh, I see I've seen it from from this from from the both sides. But I think what's the most important here when it comes to leadership and why I am in this area is that. Uh, leaders in the organizations has to they really have to take ownership on that that's one of my actually reasons why i am in this uh in this work because um uh, you know that i i don't know exactly the statistic but something like 60 70 percent of employees they um they want to get out of their organizations because of their leaders and managers and why is that is i think i can come back here to power that actually a lot of managers don't don't know how to do that and uh, they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to create space for people, to create safe space where people can feel that they are underst understood. Because I think one of the biggest, every one of us wants to be understood when it, it comes to work or personal life, wherever we are. are. And when we have people like uh, managers who doesn't, they don't know how to do it, uh, they create toxic environment for people. And if they create this toxic environment, people don't know actually... Sometimes even uh, they they don't feel that they are part of something there. They just go there, do their work, get money, but there is no this uh, more you know deeper feeling of I am part of this, and I know that when I go to my work, I'm safe. I can be myself. So in this way, I can truly um, develop the potential I can develop and really can give and serve the way I can serve. So definitely, this is a big topic for the world nowadays, and we need to learn from each other how to do it better. Mm. Yeah, because I think in what was it, 2016, they were saying that 48% of people were disengaged in their work, another 18% were actively disengaged. So that was about that 66% that you mentioned before. But before COVID, 2018, it increased by another 21%. And it was a total of 87% of people didn't want to be at work. We know that before COVID, it was six people uh, in Australia would actually take their life each and every day. Six of the eight were uh, male. That actually has gone up. Uh, it's around about nine out of the nine people a day have take, are taking their lives. We've got, uh, what was it, 48, 47% of um, business owners, small business owners had said that they'd had um, anxiety at work. 24% had said they'd had depression. And there's this argument about leave your personal life at uh, home and leave your work life at, at uh, work. And that stuff just doesn't uh, work. It's always a case of, you know, emotional beings and we take the stuff with us. And this is one of the reasons why problems in one area lead to the other and lead to bullying in the workplace and domestic violence. And as you said, we're seeing this all the time. But, you know, the thing is understanding how it's all happening and working our way around. Because I think 2019... Over 700,000 people worldwide were taking their life every year. You know, it's, you know, well, you know two, uh, th almost uh, three quarters of a million people taking their lives. So it's a major problem we've got. And the fact that we've pushed it under the carpet all that time has not done us any good. So what feedback, you know, what sort of things... If you, you know, we've we've seen. You know, we talk about the stats. We see the problems that exist, but how do we uh, get the message across to people? Any ideas? Um, can mm -hmm. I have some put in, Alan? What was that? Sorry. Can I say something? Is yeah, that please. okay? Or did you want to no, call no, on no, someone? That's what I wanted from you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I see it is. Um, the managers or the senior leaders need to be um, need to speak about their own mental health. So, in other words, by doing that, they are role modelling, and they are inviting people around them or people in the workplace to feel comfortable to come forward as well. 
because it's 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 all well and good if you um, are in a position where you can leave that particular job and maybe go to another job, but not everyone is in that position. Mm. Some people, um, you know, have families and children and to support and they have to stay where they are. They have to stay put. And so mm. if they're going to stay put, we need to make changes in those environments. Mm. And I think that providing, you know, uh, providing the environment where people can comfortably talk about mental illness, it may even be, um, you know, depending on the size of the company, providing some sort of a space where, you know, people can go and take a break or they can talk to someone or, you know, like have a coffee, um, making the, you know, the workplace safer to talk about mm. mental health. And also um, to deal with the discrimination and the harassment and the bullying, to call out the people that are doing it and to, um, you know, deal with them in some sort of a way or, you know, come up with some sort of a resolution where that's not a cool thing to do anymore. You know, mm. we're, not, we're not in school, um, not that bullying is ever acceptable in school, but, you know, we're grown up adults and, you um, it's time to behave like adults and actually realise that, you know, um, we're all in this together. That's how I see it. Mm. And sometimes some of us are not feeling that great. There are other times when other people are not feeling so great. So let's pull it all together and, you know, make it, take that stigma out of it. Mm. Yeah, as you're saying, you can't really just leave a, an organisation, well, if you do, you might go to another organisation with the same problems. Exactly. Maybe just, you know, changing yeah. you know, one for the other. Yeah, yeah. And often people are not in a position to leave. Mm. They might actually really like their jobs, but they might not be happy with um, the way um, their mental health problems are dealt with. Mm. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it's okay to take time off, but... I think that these things need to happen at the workplace. They needs, mm. they, the environments need to change, mm. not just sending them off. We'll go and have a week off. We don't, you know, we're not really that interested or, you know, someone go and find another job. I'm not saying that that's not good, but I think it needs to happen internally. Mm. There needs to be, um, there needs to be, the, the stigma needs to be taken out of it. And I really believe that, if the managers and the senior leaders are leading by example and speak about their mental health at the workplace, they will open the door for many people to mm. feel comfortable to talk about that. Yeah. We know that businesses need to get involved with it because if somebody's been bullied at work, their performance drops 70%. Of course. Those, those that are observing it, theirs drops about 40%. So mm. it's affecting their bottom line. That's this exactly is, uh, right. Paula, this is your area, isn't it? This is with the psychological safety. It's, you know, working with both the management and the staff to to get to there. So as Irina has suggested, you know, we need, you know, this is what the managers need to do. How do you work with them to uh, get that message across? So this is very, very topical at the moment. So McKinsey's did a report recently on mental health and well-being and stigma was lowest on the list in terms of um, order of priority of items to be addressed when it came to mental health and well-being. And it's the key thing that prevents people from speaking up mm. and speaking out is that stigma. So by talking more about mental health as so mental health is health. You know, previously we would kind of, it was almost like they were disassociated. There was your physical health and then there was mental health, which we didn't talk about. But what we don't realize is mental health is health because when you're in a, a negative or a bad mental emotional space, it plays out from a physical point of view in terms of our physiology as well, which is causes, physical illnesses or diseases. So, so we, we need to stop separating them and go mental health is health. And it's a, a daily necessity for us to be able to bring the best versions of ourselves to work and to home as well. So the more we start talking about mental health, the more comfortable we become with it and it's not such a taboo topic or a shh, we need to be embarrassed or, or about it and we start removing the stigma. Also that it's okay to not be okay and to put your mm. hand up and say, you know what, today I'm okay, but I'm also feeling sad. Mm. And, and that we shouldn't shy away from emotions because we are human beings, not human machines. 
Mm. We all have feelings and emotions. And this is where we need to start equipping leaders with leadership skills that brings in compassion, empathy, and understanding by allowing them to tap into their own emotional needs and emotional well-being first so that they can lead by example. And that vulnerability is not a weakness. In fact, it takes a very brave and courageous person mm. to put their hand up and say, I'm not okay. Mm. And so we need to shy away from from vulnerability as a as a bad thing or a weakness and this goes back to gender stereotyping as well you know where men are conditioned to man up toughen up don't show emotion don't show weakness mm. and women that do show emotion are considered emotional wrecks or irrational so mm. we need to we need to get rid of the the gender stereotyping the legacy the all of those things and start talking about mental health is health and it's a necessity every day to bring our best versions into the workplace very much so. And I see, keep seeing the, um, you know, we talk about the you know, the stigma side of it and talk about vulnerability and people looking at others saying, oh, you know, being vulnerable, you're weak. But then the fact that uh, going, if you ask those people about being vulnerable who aren't being vulnerable, they go, oh, I couldn't do that. And, they, you know, that's when we should be challenging them and say, well, you can't see it as being weak then. That's actually bra uh, bravery to do that. Yeah. Go ahead, Irina. So just um, listening to you um, talk about that and listening to Paula, uh, one thing that I thought of is perhaps, um, you know, um, mental health to me is quite like they're strong words. Um, I like to sometimes call it emotional well-being, you know, physical mm. well-being, emotional well-being, because I think well-being is a much more positive word mm. um, than the word mental Mm. Like there might be, I mean, I'm not saying that we should throw out the word mental health, but I just feel that perhaps there could be some more positivity by calling it emotional well-being. So, you mm. know, like looking at it from a more positive side and um, just listening to you talk about vulnerability. Um, it's interesting because I've just come from a retreat, um, a five day retreat. And normally um, these retreats are full of women more men are starting to come mm. to these retreats and they're actually talking like we, you know, when we sit at breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know, people sit at different tables and it's just so nice to see conversation flowing and sometimes even tears flowing, mm. you know, and I, I, I think that that sort of environment, we could like workplaces could really benefit by creating that sort of environment by but perhaps, you know, holding like um, not communal lunches, but, you know, lunches where, you know, today we're going to, we're all going to be okay with being emotional or, mm. you know, like having some sort of theme days or something where people feel comfortable, you know, like the, the space and where people feel comfortable to talk mm. or even taking um, you know, people away perhaps on to retreats, you know, like maybe for a couple of days and actually just all bonding, you know, because it is bonding, mm. you know, when you open up to someone and you, you share with someone, you feel a certain warmth and you feel a bond. And I, I think that's really important. Very much. So putting yeah. it in the right um, atmosphere and everything mm. goes. Demi, I can see that you've got I, I would like to say, yeah, I, I just wrote several things here and I totally agree with you guys because almost everyone was saying about that, you know, first leaders need to really take ownership on, on that. And uh, definitely that's one of the things uh, when I work with leaders, when I say I'm a leadership coach, uh, a big part of that is to be self-leadership coach. You know, that's that's what I do with people. And and uh, I really gets funny when I talk to some uh, leader and they say, okay, help my employees i know everything or i am great you know and when i hear that when i hear this from from a leader it's the first sign that wide organization has a problem is because the leader sees other people as the reason for that and uh and when when i talk to them i always say that if you are part of that that would be way more powerful for your employees uh, then if you just say, okay, work with them and I know everything and I'm going to do my work and do something else. So first thing is that uh, because a lot of leaders, they don't have the capacity 
to be what they, they they want their employees to be and if they become that if they really work on their resilience i call it and big part of resilience is be vulnerable with what whatever you have and be vulnerable with with your you know your feelings and uh sharing and it's it's way more it's way better to share your vulnerability with your employees than to just just uh, stay with it in, on, in, on the inside and you don't say anything to them and they everything of course at some point because everything you hide is going to run your life and your organization that's the reality everything you you hide is going to run the organization and uh, and 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 the uh, and the other thing is that i see that the new things are coming like new things when i say well-being in the organizations but they use them on the surface. Okay, we have this wellness center. You can go have exercise and do yoga and talk, but there is need, there is no the depth which is needed to create a change. What I mean by that is, it's not only to have it as something. It's like you have values and uh, vision, but it's just written somewhere there. It's the same, you know? You just have it, but you don't use it. You don't go in depth with it. You don't embody it. And when you embody these things, when you work on them, then the change comes. That's another thing which I see uh, is, and that's why it's very important to work personally with everyone, because then you go in this depth and then, you know, you can align everyone. And uh, team building, the word team building, I don't know how it's in Australia and South Africa, but in many places in Europe is still going somewhere, having fun only and drink or oh, only that and Recently, I was talking to someone. We had team building. What is team building? I said to him, and he was, oh, we went to this restaurant. We drank all, all night, and that was great. We we built ourselves. So, <laughs> so, so I think that's also something which the language we have towards things also we need to be changed and understand what exactly is that and how is that going to help for the organizations and the mental health and well-being. Mm. Yeah, it definitely needs to be something that's ongoing because just going off to dinner and uh, going for drinks and things like that. Um, you know, those that do it every week, so Friday night, they get together, et cetera, they, they have that uh, bond. But when you only do it once or twice here and there, you don't get that connection. But whatever you put in place has got to be ongoing. Irene. Yeah, I was just going to say that the team building drinks could actually um, add to the mental health issues. Mm. <laughs> You know, I think um, it would be nice to have a day that's called, how are you feeling today? Mm. Or, you know, or have um, outings perhaps where they can go and, um, I don't know, do an hour of yoga or do some sort of an activity with, that perhaps will open them up or will make them feel like opening up a little bit more. Mm. So rather than drinking, because I think eating and drinking is just... You know, um, I don't believe that when people are intoxicated, they really form mm. true um, bonds or a true bond. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when they're actually together, you know, yes, they might uh, you know, do it on a regular basis. But the trouble is with that, if everyone's feeling happy at those events and somebody, you know, they're all acting happy and everything yeah. else, they're seeing everybody else happening, but inside they feel really mm. unhappy then they think that there's something wrong with them, not realising exactly. that everybody else is wearing a mask as well. That's right, yeah. And not showing what's underneath. Yeah, so rather than yeah. having evening events, I would encourage day events, mm. you know, where there's no um, alcohol involved, where there's cups of teas and coffees involved and where people don't need to wear a mask. Mm. Yeah. The, I think... If I can add here, I think the reality is uh, in this one is that because, I mean, I think from our history that when people get drunk, they get real in a way. And maybe that's help, helping them in a way. But, but, I have there is but here. Uh, we know now many more healthier ways so that we can do that. So uh, before people were not aware of that and that makes sense that they did that. But now, we are totally different. I mean, we have so much more uh, knowledge how to do it. Just what we need to do is implement it. It's like the school system. I'm just going to put it a little bit aside, but yeah, you have the school system for a very long time, but we haven't made the changes with 
many school systems to really incorporate the knowledge we, we have acquired throughout this new century, the last 50, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it's the same here. So let's incorporate it. We know now that to create real connection that we don't need to drink, we don't need to get drunk, we just need to sit around the campfire maybe mm -hmm. and just talk about stuff. Just be with um just be with with ourselves authentically and if everyone can hold this space and we can if we learn to do it then it will be way more easier to really create the bond we want to create so that i mean even when we have the challenges in the organization when we have this bond when we have this connection we we, we it's way easier to really go through all the hardships Mm. I, I just want to give, I, I don't know, uh, just for a minute, can I share uh, on this story about, I, I've spoken, I don't know if, if you have heard about this guy, Dan Price. Uh, he's a Canadian uh, CEO of a company. Very long st story, but I'm going to show it for one minute. Is that this guy decided to, uh, when, because his employees had a problem with the salary and they couldn't afford houses and families and stuff so he decided to equalize the payment in the company to everyone to have the same payment like seventy thousand dollars per year or something like this mm. and this person by doing that it was two year period of course to do it because mm. it couldn't be done in the beginning uh immediately what he did was he created a family mm. between these people because everyone got their back and then when the COVID started, this is just one of the things which happened, but many, but everyone in the company decided to uh, diminish their salary, to decrease their salary 50% in order to help the company to survive COVID. Hmm. That's it. And that's exactly what we need. Hmm. And that's how we can face challenges with comp in the companies, because if we have this connection and commitment, nothing can stop us, hmm. actually. Yeah. It's like Arena said before about um, the leaders uh, leading the way. Well, in that particular case that you just talked about, Demi, I know that he was the first one. He forego, forewent all of his uh, bonuses and everything else and drew the same wage as everybody else. Everybody said he was insane. But uh, as you said, he created that family to the point that people realised that the importance of the business are working uh, for, for their future was so important that they were able to take that break as well, but they wouldn't be able to do that without him leading the way first. So leadership has to be in place. And as they say that, um, you know, we worry about being knowing everything. As they say, the uh, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room because you don't learn anything. And the definition of a businessman that I learned as I was growing up was somebody who would employ people that he or she, you know, to do work that he or she couldn't do or didn't want to do, so that not only uh, they would have other people doing the work for them, but they could go on holidays and the company would not only survive, but grow in their absence. The only way that happens is when you've got people who want to work in the business, because otherwise you're always going to have to be on the front line working in the business and monitoring everybody else. And that's exhausting. So the smart uh, bosses didn't want to be the smartest person. They wanted to hire people who were smarter than them so that they could then uh, have the lifestyle and work on their business and grow it. Well, it comes back to what you were saying, Irena. Can I just say something? Yeah, please do. So Don't I think, no, well, I just well, I wanted <laughs> to make sure you were finished speaking. Yeah. I didn't want to be rude. Mm -hmm. So I, I really believe that managers, you know, depending on the size of the company, owners of companies could really benefit from getting these skills, mm -hmm. you know, the skills, not the skills to listen, actually to be able to listen, not talk, and not listen in a way where they just want someone to finish speaking so they can say something. So, mm. you know, mindfulness skills, um, rather than um, worrying about making more money, I actually think that these sort of skills will, will in turn make them more money because if they can listen to their employees their employees will do anything for them, mm. you know, if they can welcome Sorry. them and make them feel like they're part of the family. That's really what um, a good workplace is about, a healthy workplace where people want to come to work, they want to, and they want to work together and they feel welcome and they feel, they feel understood. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, isn't that the um, uh, the conditions of uh, love to feel that you value, that contribute, mm -hmm. you have a place. Yeah. Yeah. And when people feel that way, they want to be there and they want to help the people around them. Exactly. Uh, and I think I love the fact that you mentioned before about talking about emotional um, uh, health as opposed well to being. mental health. Yeah. Because we talk about having emotional awareness, having emotional um, mm. intelligence. Mm. So I think if we use the word that, that we that brings you to uh, emotional health, it's mm. probably better than saying that leads you to mental health. Exactly. Yeah. It just and, sounds much mm. softer and much mm. more positive. And kind of inclusive, you know, mm. mental health just sounds cold. Mm. That's yeah. how it feels to me. Mm. And, um, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think the, the term mental um, processes or mm. mental processing is um, is accurate because then we're talking about the, the, the logical side of uh, how things are put together and how they flow. Mm. Whereas we're talking about mental health, well, it's all about emotions, stress, anxiety, all exactly. of those exactly. are the biggest problems. So, yeah, I think um, we should uh, start pushing to have that word changed in that context. Mm. Mm. And a lot of the stress actually comes from not feeling included, not feeling mm. hurt, um, and feeling excluded because, you know, like forget about the stress you may have from your job, but this other stress could almost be so overwhelming that people just don't want to go to work. Mm. You know, sick days would actually be reduced if people were better looked after, if people were hurt. Mm. They would want to run to work. They want to see their friends. They want to work for that company rather than not wanting to go to work because work sucks or, you know, this mm. person sucks or, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. I remember working for a yeah, boss who was, um, you know, we got paid so much sick leave each year. And, uh, but when he retired, the amount of sick leave he had was, you know, almost a, you know, best part of a year of, um, uh, that he had uh, accumulated. Mm. And the reason he hadn't taken it was, well, he didn't get sick very often, but he was always happy. He loved his work. He wanted to mm. be there all the time. He enjoyed exactly. the men that he had around him. There was exactly. a lot of camaraderie. Yes, mm. there was a lot of stirring of each other, but that added mm. to the camaraderie. Yeah, that's it's always it. done in that yeah. light-hearted manner. Yeah. There's a big difference between looking forward to going to work and mm. not wanting to go to work at all. Mm. Okay, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> this is... I think that, I think that was great. I mean, um, it was great, but it, it links back to something that was being said earlier. I think, Demi, you said around self-leadership. So, yes, while the employers have a responsibility to provide a safe working environment for their employees, which is actually a I know here in our country with the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it's a compliance requirement. Um, but but that doesn't just mean a physical, a physically safe working environment. It means an emotionally safe working environment as well. Um, but also, so, so yes, the employers have a responsibility, but coming back to self-leadership and, and what you were talking about now is we also have a responsibility to ourselves mm. to take care of our own well-being and not just leave it up to the company to take care of our well-being. And at the same time, from both sides, we need to find a compelling reason to, that gets me out of bed every day that wants me to come to work. Now, there's always going to be aspects of our jobs that we're not going to like, and we're going to have bad days in the workplace, just like we have bad hair days in our personal lives, right? But it's when you look at that bigger picture, and I think this is where the purpose comes in, you know, or being passionate about something that you do, and that that gets you out of bed and wanting to come to work and wanting to engage and wanting to participate because it's a healthy, fun environment as well. But yes, we also have work to do too. And I also want to add to that because I think now is the moment to share um, what how I see actually resilience because, of course, uh, the word I use is resilience when it comes to uh, mental health or emotional health. Um, and what I've seen is definitely one of the biggest problems is that people are not connected uh, emotionally to their work in a way uh, that they are... They, first of all, people don't know. A lot of people are not clear on their values and vision and purpose uh, 
And if people get a little bit more clear on that themselves, and also the organization get clear on itself, on, on mm. you know, its basics, I, I call them foundations, then they connect to each other. And then you have this deeper connection between them. And then people have bigger reason why they are going to work. They are not going to work just to make money or but they're going to work because they, there is something bigger than them they serve when they go to this work. And uh, I think the commitment comes, a big part of resilience is commitment, that you're really committed to something, that you really are ready to go the extra mile in order to really be at work and do the things which they need to be done there. And uh, another big part of that is that uh, um, people... As I, all of us, I, I think, agree on that. They don't know how to be compassionate to themselves. And when they learn how to be more compassionate, when they learn how to meet to meet setbacks in the right way, because setbacks are always part of whatever we do, then also that, that adds on creating this safer environment internally and externally in order to be there and continue doing the things they do. And and this is not something you you just learn by listening someone to you know talk about it or just going to exercise, but you just need to go deep inside and learn how to do that for yourself. And then, if you are a leader, teach also other people to do it. And when it comes to that, uh, when when we have these conversations, like we said around the campfire, and you've done that for yourself as a leader, then it's way easier for people to feel not only to, because you can always say you are safe here, but it's not only to say you're safe here. People need to feel that they are safe here. And this means when you, when you embody all of this in your being, this is something you cannot do with words. It just, it felt by other people. So this is something which I always say, people, it's not, it's not that you need to, uh, to you, you can always learn how to, you know, talk to people sweetly, but to embody that, to learn how to do it is a process. And when you do it, you don't even need to say something. People know that they are safe. Very good behavior. Hmm. And with the, um, as I was thinking there before, as you were talking, the, the you know, being self -comp you know, compassionate towards yourself, it's like, you know, to be able to love somebody and love them you know, truly well you need to be able to love yourself first of all. Otherwise, how do you know how to love another person? And so I think the same thing comes down to being compassionate towards other people. To be truly compassionate, we need to be compassionate towards ourselves as well, which means taking the pressures off ourselves, not having to be perfect or anything else. Because you know, we've got so many sayings that um, are contradictory, as I said before. You know, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room because if I am, then I'm not learning from anybody else. You know, everybody's learning from me, but I'm the one who misses out in that situation. But yet so many um, uh, people at the same time they're saying that will also, and I know I've done it myself, be fearful of what other people think about them, not feeling that they're the best that they could be, worrying that oh, maybe won't, people won't see me as, um, as good as I want them to see me. And I thought, well, while I'm doing that, I'm not learning. So I'm actually... Well, being fearful of other people and uh, worrying about it, I'm holding myself back. And if I'm holding myself back, I'm therefore hold, holding back the impact I can have on other people as well. And if you're running an organisation, knowing the people aren't at their uh, the happiest, not working at their best, but you know, I, you know, you know they will work their best when they are their happiest. So if you focus on the them being happy at what they're doing and feeling like they're valued and they can contribute, they will be you know, much more uh, productive. And the only way they're going to do that is by the interaction that they uh, have with their management and their leaders within the organisation and being able to uh, have an environment where they can talk to each other. Irina. I was just going to say a really great question that um, managers um, and business owners could ask their, their team or their people is, what do you need from me, mm. you know, to feel safe or to feel... Um, included um you know just even asking a question like that is an invitation for people to speak mm. because a lot of um managers and a lot of business owners kind of 
sit up here whereas everyone else sits down here. Mm. You know, they sit in their office and, you know, on their pedestal, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And I think actually going out into the main area and just saying, what do you need from me or what could I do, mm. you know, to make this experience better for you. So opening up conversations with, mm. um, you know, with um, open-ended questions like what, how, when, rather than are you okay? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that's why how are you feeling is such mm. a great question because mm. we're in a habit of asking each other, how are you today? I'm good, thanks, mm. and I'm good, thanks. Mm. But if you actually ask someone how they're feeling, they may not tell you, but it gets them to think. It. it gets them to dig in a little bit deeper. Mm. Yeah. Everybody, you ask them how you're in there, they say fine. Well, the translation of that we know is freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> That's you know? right. It's got nothing to do with what they, they're saying. Yeah. And as you said, it's like, are you okay? Mm. Again, that is a yes or no answer. And most That's people it. will always give you a yes answer. Yeah. But when you ask uh, questions, as I say, we've got two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. Mm. Use them in that proportion. And when I'm you know, you're speaking, ask every question you can think of. And when you've asked every question you can think of, ask one more. And yeah. That final question is always, from what you've been telling me, this is how I'm understanding everything. Have mm. I got it right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you have, the person, you know, you're going to have a great relationship with that person because they know that you've really cared and you've really been listening. Yeah. So you got loyal, their loyalty straight away. And at the same time, you've got rapport with them. Mm. And if they say, well, no, well, now you're in a conversation because they fine tune where you missed. Yeah. And you've got a yep. better understanding again. And then again, I would go through that last question again. Mm. Always. Yeah. Yeah. I think open ended questions encourage people to talk. Mm. You know, like it's not mm. a one yes or a no. And the conversation can flow. Mm. And more things can be achieved, you can open even that. if it's not to do with emotional well-being, to do with anything. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I don't think enough um, bosses or senior leaders are asking those sort of questions. And I think they could really benefit from some coaching skills, mm. learning some skills, like I said previously, where they sit and listen rather than be focused on, you know, providing an answer or a solution, actually mindfully listening. Yeah. And I think okay. here the, the important part also is to uh, every le uh, leader to realize what are they, what is their role actually. Because uh, again, we speak how, you know, the world changes, people are different now and uh, some leaders still see themselves as managers, like they have to manage people. And also there is a lot of micromanaging in that. And I, I remember one of the leaders I was working with, he was like 70% of the time inside, uh, kind of he was doing uh, operational work with, 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 his, with his people. And I was talking to him, but when do you have time for your, for your real actually job? And he was saying, I don't know, what's my real? Up and we are talking that actually nowadays leaders need to learn to be more facilitators than managers. What it mean by that is like you need to have the space, emotional, mental, and physical space in order to uh, attend to the needs of your employees when they need it. Because if you are part of the operational job, you are micromanaging, you are doing you 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 don't have the space, you don't have the energy in order to do that. Because if you ask from a place of irritability and fear person what what do you need it wouldn't be the same than if you ask a person from a place of peace a place of ease what do you need because when you ask from a place of peace and need and compassion the person will feel that and they're going to open up if you ask from a place of irritability they're not going to say anything mm. so so it's it's just here first of all to realize what's your position what's your real job and to do it in order to help your people Yes. I think that's on. also the, there's there's this sort of um, expectation that as leaders, because we have this title, we need to know the answers, we need to know everything, and that's not necessarily true because we don't always know everything, mm -hmm. right? 
life is a lifelong journey of learning. And even as leaders, there are times when we are uncertain and we don't know the answer, but we still have to take action. There's a difference between knowing the answer and taking action and taking action, but but with the collective wisdom in the room. And I think that's where, I mean, you know, you said around, you know, let's have these conversations. Let's, let's help them, equip them with skills to, to ask more questions and to listen than give the answer. Um, and to collectively use the collective wisdom in the room to to move us forward and shift us forward. And so helping leaders to also step into that vulnerability of, well, I don't know and I don't have the answer, but you know what I can find out, or to turn it around and go, so what do you think the answer is? Mm -hmm. And being willing to hold the space and listen and hear what the other voices in the room are saying, which is where the, where the diversity, inclusion and diversity comes in around we're including everybody and there's diversity in the room. And I know it's not as simple as that, but you know, it depends on where you're having this conversation around what DEI is, you know, because for especially here in South Africa, legacy, it's around race and gender. And in a lot of other places it is as well, but it's more than that. It, it's around being inclusive, creating a, a space where everybody feels included and that their voice and their opinion matters and that we appreciate everybody's diversity. In other words, different thinking styles, different perspectives, different views and different skills in the room. Mm. Oh, I really like that, Paula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's awesome. And I also um, think that um, managers could really benefit from being curious rather than always think, you know, feeling like they have to give a solution, like Paula said, right? Mm. So making, you know, like making it more inclusive because someone in the corner who never speaks and who never contributes to anything in the meeting may actually start to, you know, they might actually pike up and actually mm. say something, but they might have something really valuable to say. But because they don't feel included and because they told what to do, they feel too, you know, too, um, too embarrassed, not embarrassed, but too, they, too, they may be too shy to say anything. Yeah. So I think, the, I think curiosity is a great skill. Mm. And if managers learn to be more curious than to be prescriptive mm. of what has to happen. Yeah, so I really like um, Paula's last, um, yeah, yeah, last bit, whatever you want to call it. Thanks, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put myself yeah. on mute. Yeah, no, well, I look at, um, you know, things like we talk about, uh, you know, our frontline staff are the ones that serve our customers. They serve them by helping the customers get what it is that they want. Well, isn't that a manager's job then with the frontline staff is to serve them? Mm. I know there's a term used at the moment being a servant leader. I really hate that term simply because you're setting it up for failure straight away because you're telling a leader who has a, a feeling that they've got to know everything and everything else. And now they're a servant. I'm a serving leader. I will serve those people around me. And I will get the information that I need to be able to help them. And because I'm not the smartest person in the room, I, I will always go out to get from other people. And as I say, the most important thing I will learn is the next thing I learn after I think I know everything. And if a leader has that uh, idea who thought about things and goes and talks to people, and as you've all been saying, ask those questions and ask, well, what is it that would best serve you? You know, uh, Karen Chasson's a good friend of ours here in the Campfire Project and a good friend of mine. She, we were doing a talk the other week and somebody asked her, well, when, what was it like when you first met Alan? You know, what was the situation? We met at a networking uh, do and we, um, I told her my name and my first comment that came out of my mouth after that was, how can I help you? you know, there was nothing about what I do or anything else. It was just, how can I help you? What is it you're looking for? And um, that was, you know, that was as open as I could possibly, uh, well, actually you can make it even more open than the questions. Explain, tell, describe what you, you, you know, your life, what you want, you know, and you make it even broader. Then you come back to the why, what, where's, where's and how's, and you can be a bit more probing into it. And then finally, when you've got all the questions asked, you can ask that uh, yes or no answer. Have you got it right at the end? And that's the only closed question I ever ask. Yeah. 
And um, Alan, when you ask um, when you what you, when you ask that question, you're actually inviting someone to talk, That's to it. open up, mm. and to and you listen to their story, mm. right? Rather than you um, going on about what you do and how important you are, um, mm. and you know, like, and the other person just stands there, kind of feeling quite bored and not really, and they lose interest very quickly. You know, like um. Yeah, I think that's really good. Yeah. yeah. I think when you're in a situation like that, the person who talks the most loses. Yeah, totally. So uh, if you're asking the questions and you, you know, you're getting, you know, you're really connecting with the person and as long as you're genuine about it, you really want mm. to know. Yeah. And, uh, and that's one thing that, well, this is 10 years ago or whatever, when I first met you know, Karen and that's the, the thing that stuck in her mind all the way through. Mm. I was interested in finding out, you know, who she was, what it was, you know, how I could actually help her, not what she did, not what I can, you know, actually do from my business because she didn't even know what my business was. But, you know, how could I help her? How could I serve her? And that's that curiosity, mm. right? And then the other person feels hurt. Yeah. That's it. Mm. Quite simple but very effective. Mm. Yeah. That's why I said that managers could really benefit from learning some coaching skills mm. and asking, you know, those sort of questions mm. and just sitting and listening without an agenda. Yeah, well, the yeah. best coaching is coaches who don't ask, you know, who don't uh, talk, but they just ask questions mm. and uh, sit down and listen to the questions and then ask questions on those. And the person then realizes their own solutions to the situation. Yeah. Therefore, take ownership of it. So yeah. For you know, people come to me, you know, in the business, you know, when I was in telecom and other businesses before that, people would come to me and go, Well, I've got a problem. I go, Right, well, you come to me with the problem, but also come to with me suggestions for a solution. Mm. If you just come with the problem, I can't help you. But if you yeah. come with some solutions or thoughts of solutions, we can then talk about it and work out which is the best way to go. Yeah. Because from them telling me what the solutions that they thought were possible, I knew where they were coming from. And then I could then talk to them and we'd come up with ideas that would steer them off to do the things that they wanted to do to be able to fix sure. the problem. I want the problem fixed. Best way to do it was have it, them uh, really wanting to uh, fix it the way they wanted to fix it. Yeah. And also reflections, like mm. when someone's telling you something, to be able to repeat that in your own words so that they feel that they're actually being heard. Mm. Mm. Yeah. and ask questions on that to go even deeper again yep All right, i'll mute myself now <laughs> <laughs> and actually that's that's the important part here I, i'm coming back again from a place of being that um uh, it's very important for people to understand again the leaders especially that when they embody that then that is going to happen because some people say, okay, I know all the tactics. I know how to speak to people. I know how to influence. It's not that you can know everything, but it, it should be genuine, genuine, right? It should be from, from the inside. I mean, I, I can ask one thing when it's, I'm really curious about the person and they're going to know I'm curious. I can say, how are you? And they can know that I really ask them how they are, mm -hmm. or I can tell, how are you? And they know that I don't care. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that's, I think, what makes the deep work. It creates this embodiment. Mm. And that's what people and everyone need. I mean, the leaders, they, that's why they need to do the work first so that they have mm. this embodiment, they have this thing inside, so then to use it in order to help other people do it. Yeah, that's right. If you want your staff to open up, then you're the one who has to open up and lead the way. Isn't that the word leader? That's where it comes in again. Yeah. So, Paul, I know, you know, because it's one of the things that's starting to really pick up over here is that psychological safety. There's a lot more organisations looking at it. I know a lot of, you know, we're probably just ticking the boxes, but I know a couple of friends of mine are running programs that really delve into things deeply to find out, you know, the manager's role, the, the staff's role, and then looking at the different areas where they're different centres, how they're functioning compared to each other and delving in and finding out why some are working really well and why others are having issues and getting everyone involved. Is that the way it's working over there in South Africa? I definitely think there is much more of a shift towards that awareness around the impact that leaders are having on the people around them. I think it's 
there's still a lot of work to do, especially with, with middle management, because some of them feel like they're ham in the sandwich. They, they're getting pressure from above to get people to come back in the office, but mm. they're getting resistance from the bottom about people that don't want to come back into the office. Mm. So I think they, they're feeling a bit like they're ham in the sandwich, but it's how do we equip those people with the necessary skills that they need, but at the same time, how do you keep your finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening on the ground level where, where, you're, where, the, where your real people are? Because your people are your business. And if your people mm. aren't well, your business isn't well. Yeah. So yes, doing these regular climate surveys or culture surveys or whatever you call them, I think is a good thing. I think what's most critical is how it is being positioned when mm. it goes out and gets distributed and then how the results and the insights are being communicated back to show complete openness and honesty and transparency. And then thirdly, how do you close the feedback loop to go, this is what we've done? Because we've heard you. We've heard what you've had to say. We, we know that these are the problems and the issues. This is what we're doing to address these things and keep the feedback loop going so that people know that it's that something's happening. Because often, and I'm generalizing when I say this, often when we do these surveys, that's great. We've ticked the box. We've done it. And then it kind of falls falls flat there or it falls over we get back on the hamster wheel we're busy 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 do 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 and when it comes to doing the next survey people go well why must we do this because the last time we did this nothing happened right so you actually diminish any level of trust and psychological yeah. safety that you've established by doing these things yeah no i gave a talk a few years ago for a um, a group that were doing a, a full day of uh, training and the senior manager was there talking about, you know, way forward and all the rest of it. And he's talking about the importance of, you know, that's why they brought me in to have a to talk to everybody about uh, how the staff were important and everything else. But the way he conducted himself and everything else, when I was talking to people later on, people just opened up to me and they were just telling me how they just thought the whole day was a, you know, just a whitewash. It was a con to try and get them to work harder, knowing that uh, the, the senior manager had not changed one iota. And so this is the thing you have to be genuine about. You have to really care. You know, this is one of the reasons why I always find what's in it for the person I'm talking to to get their attention. And the, the person who owns the business, it's having a business that's growing, that they're making money. So I find, first of all, how that... Um, uh, by working with their staff, they will make more money and in the process show them how to do that. And it always comes back to the way they behave with the uh, the staff and that changes the way that they're, they're actually functioning. But it comes no longer about money. It becomes realising that if they look after their staff, the return's going to come. Whereas if they just chase the return, they're never going to get there because they're going to have all that opposition. Once they realise the importance of that, then they realise that they can open up a little bit and the conversations are always, if somebody says, well, they're fine, I ask them, tell me more about that. You know, how's that compared to what it was yesterday when you were fine? You know, describe what fine is to you. Asking more questions. And next thing you know, the whole conversation changes. And the number of people who had a smile on their face and saying, I was fine, at the end of the conversation are in tears. Telling you what's holding them back. And you go, great, you're now moving towards being a leader because now you've shown your vulnerability. And now you're showing their willingness to share and that's what your people are looking for. A hundred percent, Alan. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm. So just in finishing off, uh, is there any final words that um, you would like to share with the people that are listening today, whether they're bosses or whether they're uh, employees? Yes. Mm -hmm. Get curious. Um, and learn to listen more than speak and ask open-ended questions. That's to the leaders and the bosses of businesses. Excellent. And Dimi? I would say just understanding is power. Hmm. And Paula? Communication equals connection. If you're not willing to ask questions, if you're not willing to make time for people, and if you're not willing to sit in that uncomfortable, awkward space, you're not going to create safety and connection, and then you're not going to get people that are wanting to be open, and honest, and transparent. Yeah, I think um, 
when you know, if I ask an employee, you went up to an employee and said, well, you know, what can I do to uh, help you? Then the employee might be just talking about, well, I'm going through a lot of pressure, I need this. But in, if I'm in that their position, I would get, uh, actually bring it back to, well, for me to be able to be more successful in the role that I'm doing, to bring in more money and look after our clients more effectively, this is what I need. And so I include as many people around me as I can in the description. Those are, you know, in an organisation, there's what we call aboveers or belowers, besiders, et cetera, and uh, bring them all together in that so everyone can see that by doing that, we're all gaining in the process. And if I want to, you know, when I've worked with bosses in the past and I've wanted to get changes, I've asked them, you know, can I, so I can do the best job that I can possibly do, what is it you can do to help me do that? You know, how can I then make a better return for the organisation? And so the boss is going, okay, well, there's a return in the organisation for me. So, you know, this is what I need. And so it's, inc you know, the word you used before, uh, Irina and uh, Demi and Paula was uh, inclusion. So uh, it's really excellent. Okay, well, we've got to uh, the top of the, of the hour there in our conversation. But uh, I don't know about you guys, but they go very quickly when... Um, I'm uh, in these conversations because I just love the feedback that, uh, and the knowledge that you guys bring to the table. So, uh, uh, Demi, Irina and uh, Paula, thank you very much for having been here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And everybody Thanks, everyone. who's listened in today, you've got the, the contact connection, uh, 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 connections for uh, each of these uh, people. Get in touch with them follow through. If you want to know more about the psychological safety side, get in touch with Paula, you know, the connections, etc. Irina and uh, Demi. And uh, we're all here for each other. So be yep. open to ask questions. We're all in this Thanks. together. That's Thank it. you. Take Hashtag, care. Hashtag Bye. we together. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.